Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. That's the reason I expect that cyclist Africa 2015. Welcome to the first afternoon lecture um, on the Cyclist Africa High Profile Lecture Series. To see you here amid strikes and all sorts of um, interesting things that the Eastern Cape is going through today, excluding actually. Welcome to Grandstone. Holy Cross, it's great to see you there. Welcome back to Grandstone. I know you guys have traveled far. Um, it is my great privilege this afternoon to introduce to you somebody who's become a very good friend. Um, not only personally, but also of Cyclist Africa. That is Mr. Jim Adams um, of NASA, who was at Cyclist Africa last year. Um, and really, Jim is the Deputy Chief Technologist of NASA. And you know, when we get to sort of start to learn that organogram a little bit, he really is quite a big, a big chief up in, um, in Washington, in D.C. And Jim has you know, had an incredible history with NASA. He is now at, um, at U. But before that, he was the Deputy Director of Sanitary Science Division um, with NASA. And so he really has been involved in a number of NASA's missions, um, especially you know, where it comes to science. I think the thing that often impresses me most is the fact that he has worked on three of the Mars, you know, the Mars rovers. Um, I don't think many people can say that. So, Jim, it's great to have you back. Uh, Jim has also agreed to join the Cyclist Africa Advisory Committee. So, for us, you know, it's wonderful to have that kind of expertise, to have somebody of Jim's caliber um, helping us, you know, just really get this program, you know, to stay it, to keep it great, you know, the quality that it is. So, Jim, welcome back to Cyclone. Thank you for having all the way. And take a step back. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, all of you, for being here. Um, it's not that I want things to be romantic, but more should you be on the slides. Uh, How that's going to change the way we look at the universe. So, um, we'll start. Deep in the center of a star is a fusion reaction that takes protons and fuses them together into. The surface of our sun, it would it would take only three minutes of light travel to get from the center of the sun to the surface of the sun. But because of this fusion reaction and what's going on inside the sun, that is this constant energy deposition and re-radiation, it takes 10 million years for the energy that goes through that fusion reaction to get just to the surface of the sun. And then what happens, which we all learn in school, is it takes eight minutes for the light that's generated there in the corona of the sun to reach the earth. So the light that you're seeing today started its life 10 million years and eight minutes ago. So um, what that is, is right, so I'll tell you a little bit about where it comes from, and then I'll tell you. The sun is trying to tell us something about itself when you're looking at daylight. So what happens is that that energy radiates through the sun and gets to what we call the sun's chromosphere. It's like the lower atmosphere of the sun. 
And it's not just a yellow ball. It's a very dynamic and tumultuous place, the chromosphere, the corona of the sun. And it goes through cycles. It goes through a 12-year cycle where sometimes it's really active and sometimes it's not so much. And it looks different in different colors and in different ways. And this, this is one of the missions I worked on where we set up a camera to look at the sun, but instead of looking at the whole of the sun, we put a little disk in place so that we constantly had an eclipse. And what we were, what we were looking for is solar flares. Spit off bits of the sun that come streaming towards the Earth at a million miles per hour. And they interact with the Earth. They interact with our uh, magnetic field and they cause instabilities in our power grids and sometimes we end up with natural um, load shedding. And sometimes we end up with uh, telecom outages, largely because the sun is reaching out to us in its violent ways. But, like I said earlier, what the sun is really trying to do is tell us about itself. So in the center of the sun, all the colors of the spectrum are being generated. But as, it get, as that energy works its way further and further out, some of the energy is absorbed and re-radiated. And because of that, then there are spectral lines. There's, a, there's parts of the spectrum that looks less intense than others. Well, it turns out that if you look at that spectrum, and you look at those spots where it looks like there's dark spots in the spectrum, there's actually light there. There's incredible information about what's going on in the sun's atmosphere right there in the corona. And so when we send spacecraft to look at the sun, what we're doing is we are actually looking at those dark spots in the spectrum. We're not looking at the entire spectrum of the sun because those dark spots tell us about what's going on in the physics of the coronasphere of the sun. So what we see, by the way, this is just an aside, what we see is just the color bars there. The energy that's generated in a fusion reaction runs across the entire spectrum from gamma rays and x-rays and ultraviolet and the optical spectrum that you're, you're familiar with, infrared and radio. But what you see is just a little slice of what's going on as a result of the fusion reaction at the center of the sun, which is really our star. And so because of that, NASA and other space agencies, as well as other governments, set up different ways of of measuring from gamma rays all the way up to radio waves. And perhaps you've heard of the SKA, right? That's an attempt to measure the spectrum in the radio. You can see over here is the Hubble Space Telescope. We're measuring the spectrum in the visible. And you can see that there's other missions called SWIFT, which I worked on in, in um, XTE are measuring in x-rays, but the James Webb Space Telescope is going to work in infrared, and I'm going to tell you why in just a minute. <coughs> in 1905, Einstein posed this called the photo, and the photoelectric effect says that if you have um, light as a wave, and it interacts with the material, it's going to deposit energy in a packet, creates packet that we call a photon, that electrons. And so when that wave interacts with things, then energy is deposited and then they can use those electrons. So an example would be when you go out into the sun with a sunblock and you get a sunburn, that's a, an indication of the photoelectric effect. The sun has working. But you can also use that effect to gather information. One of the ways that we gather information is through telescopes. 
And this is um, a classic diagram of a reflector telescope. The light comes in from the right. It bounces off of a primary mirror, goes to a secondary mirror that creates, uh, sends it to an observer of some sort. This observer could either be an eye or it could be a camera. It doesn't really matter. But what's going on is we're focusing a beam of light down to a sensor where the photoelectric effect can then move electrons around and we can interpret the information. And so the more uh, photons that you gather, the better the picture is going to be. So the larger the bucket that you use to gather raindrops, the more rain you're going to gather. And it's a similar, it's kind of a similar analogy. And when you do that, then you can get pictures like this. This is a, this is a, a, a cloud formation. I for, unfortunately, I've forgotten exactly where it is at the moment, but gathered by the Hubble Space Telescope. And you can just totally enthralled. You're looking back at stars, suns in other solar systems that are telling you about themselves as a result of the Hubble Space Telescope looking at the light that was produced in the certain spectrum that has now come to Earth for us to collect in these things called telescopes, light bulbs. The Hubble Space Telescope is the size of a school bus. How many of you came here on a school bus today? Any of you? Some of you, right? So that, you rode, to, you rode here in something the size of the Hubble Space Telescope. That is the size of the telescope that we need in order to gather the kinds of pictures that you just, like the one you just saw, right? Obviously, the bigger the bucket, the bigger the telescope, the better the light, the better the images, the higher the resolution that we're going to be able to see. We'll be able to see dimmer, faint, more faint objects as well. So the James Webb Space Telescope, which will in 2018 replace the Hubble, is not the size of a bus. It's the size of a tennis court. And you get, you can get sort of an idea. The, uh, the reason it's the size of a tennis court is that the mirror, which is not the size of a tennis court, um, needs to be shielded from the sun to keep it cold. So that, and I'll show you a video about that in a moment. So how many of you know what this is? Anybody know what this is? It's salt, that's right. It's got an enormous telescope. And so here is a comparison. The Hubble spacecraft primary mirror. Remember we talked about a telescope that had a primary mirror and a secondary mirror. This is the Hubble telescope primary mirror. It's 2.4 meters across. The James Webb needed to be about 7 meters. And so they segmented it into 18 segments, each individually polished and taken care of. So the salt. They wanted it to be on a 10 meter class telescope, and there are 91 segments in the SALT telescope, and I believe they're all a meter across. So, um, if you ever get a chance to go visit the SALT, it's an amazing telescope, and it's right here in your backyard. And with that, then, you can get pictures like this. This one's really important. If you, if you, Take the Hubble and you look and you hold still long enough, you can look at really, really faint objects. This particular region of space was looked at and then blown up and you see this little red dot in the, in the inset box there and that's blown up for you right here. Well, it looks like fuzz, right? Well, actually what they think that it is the deepest that anybody has ever seen into the universe. That's the furthest away any telescope has ever looked. And one of the things that we've learned, and I'll tell you a little bit more about this in a moment, is further away means that you're actually looking further back, back in time. Do with it takes the light to get from its source, that fusion reaction, to here. In fact, one of the things that's going on is if you look at the age of our universe is rough, estimated to be roughly 13.7 billion years, the Hubble Space Telescope is looking out at about 
looking back in time about 12 billion years or so. By looking at a different range of frequency, that is, uh, instead of invisible in, in the visible, looking in the infrared, the James Webb will look even further into space, into the um, region of time when most of the stars were forming. If you look at in the radio, you go even further back in time, and that's one of the things that the SKA is going to help us with, looking at the at the cosmic formation of the. And so we build this enormous telescope, and here are six of the uh, eighteen mirror segments for the James Webb Space Telescope in tests in Alabama at the moment. And I don't know what that guy's doing. It looks like he's trying to stare him down, doesn't he? <laughs> One of the things that we're going to do is, in order to get further away from the heat of the Earth and from the ambient light in, the, in our region of the solar system, is we're going to send the James Webb Space Telescope out to what is known as the L2 point. It's a Lagrange point. It's a spot in the, in the Sun-Earth system where the gravity is... Um, balanced. And what we'll be able to do is to park the James Webb Space Telescope 150, 000, 150 million kilometers, I always messed that up, 150,000 kilometers out. I think that's it. Anyway, it's way out. It's well past the moon. And it's not a place that you'd ever be able to send human beings to, you know. We uh, had a problem with the Hubble Space Telescope and we sent several missions to repair it, and so we got these amazing pictures. We have to get the James Webb exactly right, because there's no way that we'll be able to send human beings to repair this telescope that's so far out. 1.5 million, thank you, Anya. It'll take us 14 days to get there. And along the way, deploy solar rays, and we'll deploy the sun shield, and then we'll start cooling down the mirror and then we'll get into this orbit around the Lagrange point called L2. So what I thought I'd do here is show you how we're going to do it. In order to do that, I have to jump out of PowerPoint. There's no sound with this. But in order to get the telescope inside the fairing of the rocket, we have to bundle it up. And then once it gets out into space, we just we get rid of the fairing and we deploy the solar array. And then we deploy the high gain antenna, which allows the data to get back to Earth. And then we begin to deploy the sunshade. And that takes a lot of time, and there's a lot of us that are very concerned about making sure that that happens correctly because we've never done one of these before. And it will unfold and then unroll. Oh, I'm sorry, I masked of the primary telescope as well. So it unrolls like wrapping paper. All of this takes about 14 days on the way out to the to the L2. And by the time you're done, you have something the size of a telescope that will enable it, the temperatures on the upper side to be the temperature of liquid nitrogen, so very, very cold. And on the underside, it'll be almost room temperature. And then the mirror segments deploy. So that you end up with a primary segment at 6.8 meters across. They really should have some dramatic music with this, shouldn't they? <laughs> some massive music. Yeah, something really spacey. But that's what the James Webb Space Telescope will look like. And when you start looking at pictures of space, deep space in the future, that after 2018, they'll be coming from James Webb Space Telescope, like we're seeing Hubble Space Telescope pictures today.
So what happens is once we've got the mirror deployed, then the, the mirror, remember the picture of the telescope that I showed you earlier, all that's doing is focusing light. It's a big light bucket, focusing light down to the observer. The observer in the Hubble is this sensor here in, on the left. The observer for the mission called Kepler is this focal plane there. But what's really going on there is it hits that sensor, the photoelectric effect bounces electrons out, we capture the electrons, and then we run it through all of this system. It's the brain of the telescope. And once we've collected all of that information, then we can send it home. And that's what we, we send it, yeah, there we go, 1.5 million kilometers from L2 to something called the Deep Space Network, enormous antennas spread around the world to the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, where they will process the images. And we'll get the pictures from the James Webb Space Telescope in the same way that you're seeing Hubble Space Telescope pictures today. Well, that's not too far off from something much more compact, and, much, and that's the human eye and brain. If you think about it, when you look into the stars at night, light is coming in through a telescope and it hits your retina in the back of your eye that sensor then sends signals to your computer your brain and you begin to realize that you're seeing stars or you're seeing a car or you're seeing a tree or you're seeing a friend right and that's what we're really trying to do with the James Webb Space Telescope is understand what we're looking at and so when James Webb Space Telescope deploys in 2028-18, the deepest vision in history. This is a simulated image of what we think we might see. Scientists will be looking at these pictures for years, and I'm sure it will continue to stun us. Where you look at the stars, this happens to be a picture that an astronaut took from of the Milky Way from um, the International or if you look at the Milky Way from Africa looking over Mount Kilimanjaro or if you're the Hubble Space Telescope and you're looking at the Milky Way you are looking at the universe telling you something about itself you're, you're looking at starlight that took roughly 10 million years to get out of the star and then billions of years to get to you so that you can look at the universe so regardless of whether or not you're thinking as a wave or a particle, regardless of whether or not you're looking at sunlight or starlight that's either 10 million and three years, uh, three uh, minutes old, or 13 billion years old, you are looking at the universe reaching out to you to tell you something about where you live. And I think that the fact that that photon was made 13 billion years ago and it ends up in your eye and that's where it ends that's where it stops it began 13 billion years ago it traveled through space didn't hit anything didn't hit another planet didn't hit any dust particles but it ended up. that's the universe reaching out to you to say i'm here and you're special and so that is the life of a photon. Thank you. Now, one of the things that I really enjoy about SciFest is the opportunity to answer questions. I have been in the space business for 35 years, and I told the folks at Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University yesterday that I had not run into a question that has stumped me yet. So I am more than happy to answer questions that either have anything to do with James Webb Space Telescope or solar physics or technology or astronauts and how they eat and live in space, although there's somebody here that could probably tell you much more about that. Um, later today, you're going to have an opportunity to go meet an astronaut.
So, and this woman, Katie Coleman, she has spent six months aboard the International Space Station and been to space three times. So, does anybody have any questions? Oh, I should also say, because I know you're all shy, that whoever asks a question, I'll give a statement to it. <laughs> Can you talk about energy and mass and whether life well, that doesn't have mass? Light actually does have mass. But it does have mass, but nothing with mass can tell you speed of light. So that conundrum? It is a conundrum, isn't it? E equals mc squared. So energy is equated by the mass of an object times its velocity, and light is has a has a mass that you can figure out because you know what its energy is and you know what its speed is. So it actually does have a mass. It's uh it's very hard to get your mind around, but it actually does have mass. So, um, but you get sick. <laughs> yes. Um, can, can I read out the spacecraft thing on the side? So, yes. I'm being replaced by NASA uh, ESA. So there's there's been a long line of solar imaging spacecraft. SOHO actually isn't. It's, uh, it's not going around the sun any faster than the Earth is. So is going to the L1 point, or it is at the L1 point, the Lagrange 1. And that's a spot just like L2 that's between the Earth and the sun. And um, what we did, as Soho got older and older, and technology advanced more and more, we uh, put together a partnered uh, spacecraft, a partnership called um, Solar Dynamics Observatory. And instead of sending it all the way out to L1, we've put it into what we call geostationary orbit, which is where all of the cable TV satellites are, telecom satellites are. But instead of looking at Earth, it's looking at the sun. I, I, told, you, I told this one, and um, it's getting actually closer to the sun. Oh, you're thinking of uh, Solar Probe. Uh, solar Probe. Uh, I may even be calling it Solar Probe yeah. Plus by now. It's still in development, and uh, do the launch later this decade. You get a sticker. But I really like to give these stickers away to kids. Yes, we got one over here. All right. On the stars form. So gases collect, the theory is that gases collected a long time ago, and as particles get closer and closer together, because they have mass, they have an attraction, that's gravitational attraction. So two bits of gas get together to attract more bits of gas together. And they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually they get so massive, so compressed that they start compressing the little bits in the middle. And that's where the fusion reaction comes. These little bits of gas, these protons, are actually they gas comes together, it gets ionized, and it's then you squeeze them together really hard, and that creates a fusion reaction, and that ignites a thing called a star. And there's a theory that says that Jupiter might have been a star, except for it just stopped forming before it gathered enough mass. So the, the center of Jupiter is actually Hydrogen that's been squeezed together but hadn't quite ignited in a fusion reaction. Yes? You said that there's a way that the sun interacts with Earth by its natural motion and so on. Do the, does the sun, which is the sun, do they come to Earth and like, call it meteoroids or something? Yeah, they do. They fall as particles, uh, ionized particles, but the Earth is an amazing place. You are protected on Earth by a number of things. The first thing that protects us is the moon, right? The moon actually sweeps out any particles, not any, not all of them, but many. Things. Then there's also the Earth's magnetic field. And the Earth's magnetic field deflects most charged particles that come at us from the sun. And what they do is they, they get trapped by our magnetic field and they tend to spiral down to the north and south poles. On their way in, they interact with our atmosphere, which is like a third layer of protection. 
And have you ever seen the northern or southern lights? In the, in the northern hemisphere, we call it aurora borealis. It is that, that light that's glowing as a result of the sun's particles having been trapped by the magnetic field and then interacting with the upper atmosphere. It's a really great question. Um, I'd like to ask if you're interested which you have to learn more about? Oh, that's an awesome question. And so, um, what, what I would say is, if you're in high school and you're not going to like this answer, you should study math and science. <laughs> okay. However, if you work for NASA or if you work for SANSA, which is the South African National Space Agency, or if you work for SKA, they hire lots of other people. They hire English majors, and they hire lawyers, and they hire um, communications people, right? So there's lots of ways that you could work in this industry. But what I studied was in college or university, I studied physics. And then I got my master's degree in electrical engineering along the way. I did it while working, though. So, um, so I did physics and electrical engineering. Other people can do astrophysics and material science. There's mechanical engineers. So there's lots of different things. And what I would encourage people like you to do is to dabble in things and find out what you really like. And then go look for an industry that might utilize that skill. Because I can tell you that the space industry uses almost all of it. So you go off, study mechanical engineering, for example, that video that we showed in the James Webb Space Telescope, thousands of mechanical engineers worked on, on developing that, right? And then it's just a matter of just networking with the right people, making sure that you know where the opportunities are. And space science is an up-and-coming field in South Africa. I know that for a fact because I'm working with your Department of Science and Technology to help make that a reality. The University of Stellenbosch is awesome. Cape Town is, is an awesome place, um, and there's a number of other universities around South Africa that are producing excellent engineers. Yes? My question is more on the that the uh, reason why you're making this big telescope is to increase the understanding of Mm -hmm. But uh, what I need to do is maybe something around the moon before we even get to the sun, Mars, sun, and there. How much do we know about this place? Uh, Why are we exploring further and what we are here somewhere around this? So that maybe we just maybe we find it in the first place and we can explore some of the data. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So the very first space scientists actually originated in Africa. There were people that looked at the stars, they didn't have telescopes. Right? They're the ones that looked up and they named them and they said, Oh, that makes a picture. And that, that one comes around this time every year. Or this one, if I see it, it means something. Right? So it is one of the oldest sciences, even without telescopes. So that is a, that is a, to be, a, to be looking at the stars and asking questions about the universe in which we live in is something that's fundamental to human existence. But you still ask, you make a really good point about policy. So what else can space science do for us? Space science can look at the Earth. And I have a talk uh, that I'm giving later this week on how investing in space changes life on Earth. So you can, you can watch floods and fires. We, we watch pictures, we've got pictures from the Cape Town fires, right? So in the United States, we have a fire season in California every year. We use space science to tell firefighters where to go to put out the fires, right? We have sent people to the moon. We continue to study the moon because the moon 
tells us a lot about how the earth was formed without having been transformed over the millions of years by our own atmosphere and our own plate tectonics and everything. So you just the moon, you're looking back to the time period when we earth. We've been to Mars. We sent lots of things to Mars. In fact, as Anya said, I was part of the Mars uh, teams that landed three different missions on the surface of Mars. And that's telling us a lot about how maybe life originated here on Earth. So every science question that you can ask, whether it's in biology or whether it's in astrophysics or whether it's in um, uh, chemistry, Every experiment of some sort in order to be able to understand the answer to that. Oftentimes what happens is when you get the answer, you've got more questions. But that's just the nature of science. So if you ask the question, how is the Earth changing? Space science can help. If you ask the question, where did we come from? And where might we be going as a planet? Space science can help. If you ask the question, about the stars that you see, space science can help. So, and that, I believe, is why nearly every nation that has um, the economic capability, such as South Africa, has a space department and, a, and science departments in their universities that are looking at astronomy, they're looking at earth sciences, they're looking at planetary science. So that's a great question too. Hope I didn't, I didn't talk too long. Thanks. Steve? Yes, Steve. Um, you were telling us about photons that leave a star 13 billion years ago and then come here over 13 billion years. Over such a long period of time, such a long distance, does it not degrade or lose momentum at all? It does not. However, unless it runs into something, and then you don't see it, right? With one exception, and that is a photon comes zipping through the solar system, so actually zipping through the universe towards Earth, headed towards us, and if it comes close to another star, then that star is massive enough to gravity on the mass of the photon, and it bends it just a little bit. Albert Einstein actually proposed that effect as well. And, um, and there, then what happens is it, it changes course as a result of that. Mm -hmm. But also, over time, if you look at the, the array of photons that, that that happens to, it actually, the star actually helps to bend them in a way that makes it seem like a lens. And so there's this lensing effect that happens on the photon's path towards Earth that actually makes the object that we're seeing look bigger as a result. And so it's a, it's a physics effect that we're just now beginning to understand. But for the most part, a photon has to interact with nothing except for the observer which would either be your eye or the focal plane of a telescope be. Um, but when it say the gravitational field pulls it, doesn't that slow it down? Or? It changes it just a little bit, but it's moving so fast that for the most part, you don't see, see much change. Yeah. Oh, I should say, I'm sorry. You know, I left this part out. It's a good point. I should say just the journey through the solar system and the universe, and because the universe is expanding, that causes, I, I totally left this part out, <laughs> that causes the, um, uh, the light that was emitted 13 billion years ago to begin to shift. You all know what Doppler shift is? Mm -hmm. You know, like when a car is going by, and, or a train, and a whistle is going, and it changes tone from, approach to departure. Well, radio waves, light, do the same thing. And so when, when you look at visible light, such as Hubble, you're looking at light that was emitted at a different wavelength. 
And then across the universe, in its journey, it has shifted down into the wavelength that we can now see. Well, the reason we put James Webb in the infrared is because we want to see what the visible universe looked like 13 billion years ago, 13.7 billion years ago. So in order to see what the universe looked like in the optical, we actually have to look in the infrared. And that's, by the way, why the radio astronomers look in the radio. They're actually looking deeper into space and deeper into time. They're looking at objects that were emitting light much earlier that have, over time, shifted into the radio waves. And the reason the universe continues to expand. Want a sticker? Stick How much time have we got on you? Enough. Yes. I wanted to ask that. How did it happen that out of all the planets and the planet and so forth like when when is special about how it is from the planet? Oh <laughs> <laughs> I so, really have. Uh, yeah, how much time do we really have? <laughs> this is a whole other lecture. Yeah. That's right. In fact, the last time I was here I gave a lecture at Rose on finding life beyond Earth. Right? So there are three most likely places to find life in our solar system. Do you know what, what they are? One is Mars. The other is a moon of Jupiter called Europa. Want to guess where the third one is? No, Earth. Sorry. The two, high, the two most likely places to find life beyond Earth are Mars and Europa. And I'm going to take a long time, if I've got five minutes, I'll tell you the story of finding life beyond Earth. I'll try and be short. If I put you to sleep, just let me know. Anyway, um, at Mars, we're seeing clouds of methane. And that methane comes and goes as a result of, well, we're, we're not exactly sure why it's coming. Well, where does methane come from? Methane comes either from geologic activities, you know, like volcanoes and stuff, or it comes from life, like cows you know, and other decaying matter, right? So what's going on on Mars? Why is there methane being produced on a seasonal basis at Mars? Well, when I was deputy director of planetary science and we found these results, um, Jim Green, who still is the director of planetary science and will be a SciFest lecturer on Tuesday of next week. Um, he and I set up a bet. And he bet that there were microbes under the surface of Mars that come awake during a warm season and they emit methane because they begin to metabolize. Right? And so that we can have a decent bet and and make it public, I had to choose the opposite. I had to say, no, it has to do with geologic activity. Right? So we still haven't decided who's the winner, but the winner buys the other estate dinner. And I, to, to be honest, I'd be happy to lose that bet. It would be an awesome thing to find out that there were microbes on Mars um, as, a result of, uh, as a result of methane measurements. The other spot is this place called Europa. Now, any, anybody around on Earth, if, you, if you're looking for life, you can find it wherever there's water, pretty much. You pull a droplet of water from anywhere and you can find bacteria and microbes and a variety of other things, all the way up to elephants. You know, you find a, find a body of water and there may be an elephant that comes in tomorrow to drink from it. So, um, if one of the things that we decided we would do is look around our solar system for the places where there's water. Well, Europa is a moon of Jupiter about the size of our moon. But it's got a, an ice shell that's several kilometers thick. And under that ice shell is an ocean of water. And we know that by looking at it with the Cassini probe, um, with the Magellan probe. And I'm sorry, maybe it's not. Uh, Europa is a moon of Jupiter. It's probably not Cassini. Anyway. We know it because we sent the mission to Jupiter to look at it, right? And, and what's inside of Europa is water. 
not a little bit of water, but two to three times as much water as the Earth has is inside this moon of Jupiter called Europa. And not only is it water, but it's liquid, which means it's like zero degrees C, which we all know uh, animal life can exist in water that's at zero degrees C. So we say to ourselves, if there was a place to look in our solar system, Europa would be one of those places. Even more so, Jupiter has a magnetic field much like ours, and it traps the particles from the sun, and it's got a huge radiation belt as a result of that. So as Europa goes through the magnetic field, it's getting pelted with this radiation. And the ice on the surface is being disassociated into its fundamental hydrogen and oxygen. And over millennia, that oxygen dissolves down through the ice shell. And so now not only do you have liquid water, but you've got oxygenated liquid water. If there was a possibility that there's life, those are the conditions that are necessary. I'll even blow your mind a little further. We sent a mission to fly through the tail of a comet. The mission is called Stardust. And we flew through the tail of a comet container, collected some of this tail of a comet, and brought it back to Earth. Now, comets come from a region out beyond, way out beyond Pluto called the Oort Cloud. The Oort Cloud is the for formation, the remnants of the for earliest formation of the solar system. What did we find in the tail of a comet that originated in the Oort Cloud? We found amino acids. The building blocks of life, I would say, are ubiquitous in our solar system. So now it becomes a question of, what do you think about evolution? What do you think the probability is that given the right conditions, those amino acids might have evolved into something higher form like life? And I'll stop by telling you a funny story. NASA was looking for a new theme for planetary science. And then um, it was, had been follow the water, now we were testing out the theme called uh, uh, Seeking Signs of Life. And one of the things that we did was we tested an audience of random subjects, people we just pulled in off the street and wanted to be part of it. And uh, the facilitator asked them, uh, anybody know what Europa is? And most of the people said it was a cafe or a continent or something like that. But he was patient and he explained to them, no, 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 it's a moon of Jupiter. And he explained to them pretty much what I just explained. And then he asked them, he said, if NASA were to find life in Europa, would that be an important scientific finding? Would that be something that would be valuable and worth investing in space for? And everybody in the room, there were 35 people in the room, everybody in the room from high school students to grandmothers shook their head yes. And then he said to them, well, what if I told you the life that NASA expected to find there was algae? Pretty much everybody still said yes, except for one high school girl who raised her hand and said, well, if it's algae, I'm not interested. You have to bring me a puppy. <laughs> and I think that's, you know, that's in part because you know, science fiction tells us if we find life out there, it's going to be intelligent and it's out to get us. But in fact, I think what we will find are microbes or algae or things that will tell us more about where we came from than where it came from. That's an awesome question, and I appreciate the fact that you asked it. So here, here's the thing. Yes, uh, could I last go question. to health, and health, health issues? I and mean, there's a quite a powerful political knowledge around the world that has a uh, magnetic spectrum. Yeah. Especially the non-ionizing radiation. Right. Um, are, are you scared of the sun? Uh, would you live under microwave cell phone towers? And things like that. It was able to fight this virus. So everything that exists on Earth came from uh, exists because of the sun. Our sun is the source of all the energy that keeps us alive. And uh, one of the one of the stars before our sun is what helped to make the material that makes up our earth. So no, I'm not scared of the sun. Um, 
I think it's smart to, to be careful with the electromagnetic spectrum, especially when we're making it and, and not nature. But I don't think we should live our lives in fear of technology. And, um, and I, I think that what we need to do is just to be smart and pay attention to the way life is changing and then decide if that's the way we want to go or not. And I realize I'm kind of punting on your question. But in fact, I'm not afraid to be alive today, and I look, I'm look i quite excited about what's going on uh, in the world because of the ways that we've been able to harness the electromagnetic side. That's a good question, too. I gave you a sticker already. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I appreciate the fact that you've been such great listeners, and I'm here all week. If you have any questions, feel free to stop me in the hallway. I'm more than happy to chat. Thank you so much for listening.